Okay, welcome uh, everyone to our um, CRS uh, OACD Common Reporting Standard webinar. We have a great panel uh, prepared for you today. Uh, let me just get uh, some admin issues out of the way. Uh, basically, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we're going to have an audio recording available uh, in a few weeks for everyone to listen to. We'll also have a live transcript, a full transcript of the events that we're going to share with everyone and we're going to blog about. Uh, please keep in mind that there is a um, handout available to everyone who is attending this event. It's uh, basically a special offers, offer for uh, Ishna's uh, CRS book. He uh, gave us a discount on everyone, so if you're interested in taking a look, please download that handout. Uh, with that said, uh, let me introduce uh, Samantha Snow, our moderator. Uh, Samantha is a client services manager for Abacus Corporate Services Limited in Malta. She has over 15 years uh, of uh, experience in VAT and in direct tax matters. She initially began her career as a VAT assurance officer with uh, Her Majesty Revenue and Customs in the UK, carrying out VAT inspections, uh, before moving on to work with two of the big four accounting firms. Uh, Sam has vast experience of indirect tax matters, having worked with both domestic and international clients across a diverse range of sectors, mm -hmm. including the remote gaming, financial services, yachting, and property and construction industries. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam offers VAT expertise across both advocates offices, and as client services managers, is responsible for leading uh, the Malta team in the development of client relationships and enhancing technical skills with particular focus on the yachting industry. With that said, uh, the floor is yours now, Sam. I will be back towards the end of the uh, panel to say goodbye and wrap things up. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you ever so much, Matteo, for that great introduction. And welcome, mm. everybody, for joining us today. Um, we've got a great panel of speakers lined up for you. So today we're going to talk about the OECD's Common Reporting Standard. To tell you more about this, I'm pleased to introduce you to our three speakers. Paul Hundius, who is the Policy Advisor at the OECD Centre for Tax Policy and Administration. We have Stuart Gibson, the Editor of Tax, tax Notes International, and Ish Agarwal, Senior International Tax Specialist at Azure Consulting's DMCC. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to each of the panellists to introduce themselves and to give you a little bit more background about their work. Paul, could I ask you to start? Yes, absolutely, Samantha. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to all of you. To, um, it's a very interesting opportunity to be able to speak to people in many different locations via the camera. I hope the technology will be with us. Uh, usually, uh, lawyers do not have a have a good, uh, should I say, do not have a good karma when it comes to technology, but we're hopeful. So, uh, just a brief introduction. Um, I've been with the OECD Center for Tax Policy since 2014, and and. Uh, my focus uh, in terms of work is very much on tax transparency issues um, and of course uh, when you say tax transparency uh, you say OECD common reporting standard um, and as part of the BEPS project of course also country by country reporting and the uh, transparency uh, in the harmful tax practices framework and of course that's uh, very much centered on uh, the uh, exchange on tax rulings so that's uh, uh, my focus in terms of work. Um, before I joined the OECD in 2014, uh, I was uh, in private practice for seven years, uh, advising on international taxation, and of course also that's uh, how I ended up here, uh, doing a lot of exchange of information related work. Um, in, the, in that period of time, of course, that was a lot of on request uh, related litigation and uh, FATCA matters, of course. Um, so where are we now at the OECD? Very briefly, in in terms of the common reporting standard, I think it will come as no surprise to you that everybody is fully in implementation mode. Um, the, the, the time the, uh, the core text of the common reporting standards was finished uh, in mid-2014 is of course already quite a while ago. And now countries around the globe um, are, are actively uh, putting in place legislation and also of course the operational and IT infrastructure. Um, and, and if I say countries, and that is of course both true for governments and for the financial sector that is actively preparing. And, and in that framework we do a, uh, a lot of guidance, uh, FAQs, uh, you all know the implementation handbook I suppose that we have issued and we're working on a revision uh, at the moment to, to bring it fully up to date with the latest developments. Um, and in addition to that, of course, there's also a lot of government uh, uh, technical assistance and, and that type of work going on. So a very broad of implementation related 
uh, work. Uh, that's our focus at the moment. And uh, we, of course, see the first exchange date uh, in 2017 coming closer at a very high pace. Um, I think with that, I'll uh, hand it over to the other panelists and back to you, Samantha, um, for, uh, uh, for, for the next introductions. I've done. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Paul. That was a really interesting introduction and gives us a great background to, to what you do at the OECD. Um, Stuart, could I perhaps ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Samantha. I'm Stuart Gibson, and since October 2014, I have been the editor of Tax Notes International, published by Tax Analyst just outside Washington, D.C. Before that, I was 30 years with the U.S. Department of Justice Tax Division, and uh, some of you may have heard about a little case that I filed against UBS in 2009 to compel them to give the IRS information about Americans with undeclared bank accounts. And I kind of feel like I gave birth to a lot of this uh, uh, exchange of information and transparency movement because shortly after that, the U.S. Congress passed the FATCA law. And uh, now we have CRS uh, to make FATCA global. So I'm very excited to be editing and reporting on issues about transparency and openness and exchange of information. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Stuart. So we're going to blame you then for all the things that might go wrong in the future. <laughs> um, Ish, could I ask you to give us a little bit of background? Yeah, hi. I'm Ish Agarwal. Uh, just to let you know, I've trained as a chartered accountant in the UK. Um, that's when I got my first taste of uh, offshore, if you like, and international tax. Um, I left the UK in 97, uh, lived in the Isle of Man for a few years, then I moved to Cyprus, and now I've been in Dubai now for around 12 years. So if you like, I effectively live the offshore life, not simply uh, advising on it. Um, I got into the OECD uh, Common Reporting Standard by accident, one of my um, one of my top uh, clients requested a report on it, and I then I, as I delved into it, I realized what a mess it is. And uh, but luckily, we now have uh, Paul here to answer any uh, any <laughs> any uh, issues which are ambiguous. Indeed, and I'm hoping we'll hear more about the book that you've written as well on the subject. So I'm sure that will help out as well. Um, so, the Common Reporting Standard is the latest tool to be used to tackle global tax evasion. Um, I believe at the moment there's more than 100 countries have agreed to implement the CRS, and of course, with so many countries involved, there's quite a number of issues that are coming up. Um, today we're going to talk about some of these questions that everyone has on their mind, uh, and hopefully our expert panel here will be able to provide some insight to help everybody who's going to be involved with CRS. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's go to our first question. Um, and Paul, perhaps maybe it's worth starting with you um, to have a, a view from the OECD's perspective. Can you tell us more about which countries seem to be the, fur uh, the furthest along in terms of implementing CRS and maybe um, an understanding of the reasons behind this? Uh, yeah, well, I think I think broadly speaking, of course, um, and I think that's due to the commitment process that was organized at the level of the Global Forum back in 2014, um, there are two big waves. Um, there is one wave of countries, of course, that will first exchange in 2017 with respect to uh, uh, the year 2016, and then there is another group of countries that will first exchange in 2018 uh, with respect to the uh, reporting year 2017. Um, so that already splits up uh, the countries in two big groups. Uh, the first group, the 2017 group, if you want, uh, being 55 jurisdictions at the moment, and the second group, 46, which then, break, of course, gives you the total of the 101 committed jurisdictions overall. Um, and I think if you look, uh, with, with respect to your question, if you look to the, to, the, to the landscape for the 2017 countries, of course, it's those jurisdictions that are furthest in implementation um, uh, with, with a very big group of them having um, uh, uh, the legislation in place uh, for uh, the 2016 reporting that of course is already ongoing, um, at least in terms of the due diligence requirements uh, with the reporting being due at the end of the year. Um, so, so, so there the landscape is, I guess, quite clear and of course in, in a certain way the European Union uh, uh, area is in a, in a in a little bit of a special position in the sense that the EU, as you will probably know, has uh, 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 agreed on a directive to implement the common reporting standard and, and therefore there is a certain level of harmonization at the level of the European Union 
um, and, and, and countries, uh, EU member countries are, uh, for the largest part, have transposed and some of them are still transposing the, uh, the uh, common reporting standard in the directive that was, uh, that was uh, drafted on that basis into their domestic law. And what you also, of course, now see is that a lot of countries are now also coming out either as a consultation draft or as a final version with additional guidance for their domestic setting. So I think that's the broad landscape, and I, I think uh, in, in, in the natural course of things, it's of course uh, the 2017 jurisdictions that are that are uh, further advanced than the 2018 jurisdictions in terms of implementation, um, and, and the landscape is slowly but surely. Uh, that's what we see uh, through uh, speaking with governments uh, is, is uh, surely but uh, slowly but surely uh, filling up, and, and, and we get to full implementation across the board. I mean, from my perspective, uh, I mean, obviously, I deal much more heavily from a tax point of view. Um, obviously, everyone uses these words in the EU and harmonisation. Um, How is the OECD going to ensure that the CRS is implemented uniformly and consistently across all participating jurisdictions? Um, that, that's a good question, and of course, it's a major concern for us. Uh, I, I think from the outset, the project was very much a project um, uh, aimed at creating a, a global level playing field, so uh, making sure that the common reporting standard is implemented uh, throughout the globe and, and also, of course, in an effective manner. Um, and and um, at the moment, uh, I think what we're doing is we're, we're conducting regular implementation surveys with our uh, membership, and that it also includes, I think that's, that's, that, that has now shifted uh, f in terms of focus from the OECD uh, more uh, into the global forum space because, of course, there the membership is much wider and we can actually reach all, all committed jurisdictions. And we're looking into how implementation is progressing and, and, and uh, of course, also at the level of the global forum there is uh, work going on uh, to make sure that the, the, the crucial parts of the global forum, uh, of the common reporting standard, uh, are being uh, assessed by the global forum in a timely manner and, of course, that will eventually lead to a a peer review process at the level of the global forum uh, that will, uh, of course, as, as, a, as a main objective, ensure the um, uh, uniform uh, implementation uh, of the common reporting standard, and of course, also to highlight where there are deficiencies and, and, and make sure that these ones are uh, these deficiencies are repaired uh, um, as, as time goes by. Ish, do you have any comments on on the implementation process regarding the sort of uniformity? Yeah, I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I disagree with the OECD. I don't believe it is a, a level playing field at all. Uh, what you have is uh, you have effectively a carrots and stick approach, uh, where you have carrots for countries with taxpayers' funds that have moved offshore. They're desperate to get those back, and so they have an incentive to implement the um, the CRS. On the other hand, the net beneficiaries of funds don't have an incentive, if you like, to reveal uh, reveal their data. And so for them, sticks are required. And you, invariably, those are the exact jurisdictions that don't actually have the financial resources to implement uh, the CRS. So it's actually a bit of a, a mess, and it remains to be seen how well it will be implemented. Uh, the, the OECD seems to be in a massive rush. I mean, FATCA itself, even after so many years of implementation, only 20% of financial institutions have actually managed to grapple and come to terms with FATCA. 80% are still struggling. Um, the OECD talks um, about uh, countries uh, implementing it as if it's that's fine, the countries pass the law. But the reality is it's what's on the ground that counts. Which financial institutions are ready? How many trust companies are ready to, to file everything? Investment funds, etc. And that will be that will be the reality uh, on the ground. Indeed. Stuart, from a, I mean, obviously you were involved um, with the FATCA uh, when it was first introduced. I mean, can you give us any insight into sort of how things initially transposed when it was, when it was implemented? Well, I thought, uh, I thought Ish made a very good point about uh, how much lead time financial institutions need to be able to comply with these kinds of reporting requirements and build the systems so that they can not only report pre-existing accounts, but also do the know your customer requirements uh, for new accounts. Uh, the FATCA law was passed by the United States in late 2010, and the first reporting under that law under the uh, intergovernmental agreements that the U.S. signed with a host of countries uh, was last September. So 
it was a little over, it was just about five years from the time that the law was adopted until banks were required to begin complying and countries were having to make sure that their financial institutions were in compliance with U.S. law by uh, reporting. So uh, it is a fairly aggressive timeline for OECD. I, I will say, however, that uh, the Global Forum is predates 2014 and the notion of OECD countries and other countries participating in the Global Forum doing the self-audits to make sure that they have the systems in place to comply, that, that's not new. I mean, it's relatively new in the history of taxation, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not as new as the common reporting standard. So uh, I understand the, the concerns that ESH has expressed, but it does seem to me that most of the world has, has seen fit to adopt this aggressive uh, reporting approach, and it will, be, it will remain to be seen whether financial institutions will be able to meet those deadlines. Indeed. Paul, do you have any, have any thoughts about or comments around the, the fact that sort of the aggressive nature that sort of us on the other side of the coin is where people having to do the reporting are feeling? Um, yes, I think, I mean, I think uh, um, both Ish and Stuart uh, raise valid points as, as of course, there uh, uh, is a, and I think that's, that's fully acknowledged at the level of the of the OECD and our in our working parties and and, and 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 indeed also in the secretariat that of course there is a uh, major task for financial institutions and 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 uh, um, in particular if you uh, speak about let's say the the, the less traditional uh, financial institutions in terms of the definition for common reporting standard purposes uh, I think Eve was referring to to trust uh, companies and 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 the, and the fund sector of course uh, they're they're even less the uh, uh, reporting obligations uh, used to be a, um, um, uh, a known fact. I think financial institutions they definitely in the European space are relatively used to automatic exchange of information under the savings directive, for instance, already. Um, but nevertheless, it's clear that um, in terms of, of scope and timelines, there is a lot to be done. Uh, I think we realize that and we try to help where we can by making common IT formats available. Um, responding to FAQs when they come in from the business community and provide as much support on an international level as we can. At the same time, of course, uh, I, I think the, the, the facts also speak for themselves. Um, there, there, there has been a very clear drive towards more uh, transparency. Um, uh, of course, this whole process has started in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, um, which then eventually, uh, as Stuart has already said, led to FATCA in 2010. Um, I think as a consequence, um, and that's also probably uh, one of the reasons why uh, the time frame uh, for the implementation of FATCA is longer or was longer than what the time frame is going to be for the common reporting standard, um, is precisely that I think it took some time also for the United States um, to realize that uh, most likely the intergovernmental approach is the more uh, uh, efficient and, and, and uh, a more desirable approach in terms of reaching the objectives of, 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 of tackling offshore tax evasion and creating additional transparency. And I think if you look to the timelines, always bearing in mind that those that have committed to 2017 are early adopters and the standard has been agreed fully in 2014. Um, I think if you look to the standard timeline, if you want, of 2018, uh, the standard commitment uh, that was asked from countries, that, that's a four-year horizon. Uh, certainly there is a lot to be done in those four years and, and we're working on that very actively on all levels, uh, international organizations, uh, national governments and indeed the financial sector. Um, but I think the world is changing and we're moving to, where, to more transparency um, and a crucial part of course of achieving that will be to also ensure effective implementation both by financial institutions that will mainly be a task for domestic governments to make sure that our financial institutions comply um, and then at the second step also to make make sure that countries comply and as I said uh, we are working on a peer review process for that and as part of the uh, Panama Papers uh, consequences uh, the uh, OECD has also been mandated to come up with a new set of objective criteria for if you want blacklisting countries and we are actively working on that as well and of course automatic exchange will play a crucial uh, role in, uh, in, in that piece of work. Excellent, that's great. Um, with the with the you know the mention of Panama Papers and leaks and other security issues that now are, are at the forefront of people's minds you know in this day and age, 
Um, are there any concerns about how, how participate, uh, participating jurisdictions might potentially misuse the information obtained through this automatic exchange? Yes, and I think that is, uh, of course, an important focus if you think about the, uh, the way uh, the international framework for the exchange of tax information is. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you look under Article 26 of the Double Tax Convention under TIA or indeed if you look at the provisions of the Multilateral Convention, um, that of course is the, is the most frequently used instrument for the automatic exchange of information. Um, all these instruments uh, have clear limitations on use and of course also have very stringent confidentiality provisions and, and it is, it is uh, I think, has been for a, for a lengthy period of time been OECD policy and I think that's even more true now that we are in the automatic age um, to adhere to those principles. So our, our approach has always been that we want to be absolutely sure that the information that is actually exchanged is used for the purposes for which it is exchanged, so for tax purposes. Um, and, and of course also that the information is treated as confidential and that there are no leaks. Um, I think the, uh, there, there are three, probably three elements that are worth mentioning in that, in that context. One I've mentioned, those are the provisions in the treaties that of course provide the legal uh, basis and the legal protection. Um, then there is another piece which is at the level of the Global Forum uh, where we are uh, in the midst of the process of carrying out confidentiality assessments where all um, uh, committed jurisdictions are being subject to a, a confidentiality review process that's, that's of course legal but also operational where we actually um, uh, go to the countries and ask the countries uh, to explain how they will ensure that at the level of their tax administration uh, the CRS data is going to be treated confidential and how that is made sure that there are no leaks and that it is secure. And then thirdly, I should mention that the OECD is also in the, in the light of the automatic exchange programs that are underway, the CRS of course is the uh, as the big, first big project and then a country by country reporting and, and the exchange of tax rulings. Um, in, in that light we're actively working um, towards uh, putting in place a, a, a global uh, common transmission system that tax authorities can use uh, to transmit data from A to B, so from one country to another, um, through a common pipeline if you want. And of course the purpose of that pipeline is that it is uh, top notch in terms of security and technology to make sure that we do not have uh, uh, leaks or any other confidentiality or security breaches when we actually start transmitting this taxpayer data. Right, I mean, Ish, from a, from a client perspective, I'm sure maybe you've got some thoughts around this subject as well. Yes, I think so. I mean, but we have we have now um, a huge amount of data flowing through so many parties, uh, going from the first to the financial institutions, then to the local tax authority, then spread to other tax authorities, and you know when you look at the U.S. government and how you know Edward Snowden managed to leak everything, and then you look at Julian Assange, etc. I don't believe uh, the data is safe. Um, it can be leaked and the proof is that you only have to look. If the US can't stop it, I don't see how the OECD can. Um, also many countries, there are so many countries involved, they have various degrees of legal sophistication. The legal systems work, rule of law, corruption. Um, so you don't know where the data will be, you know, you can, they have the Sun newspaper buying data in India from a call center. You don't know how data will leak. Um, I also believe there's a risk of information being misused. Um, for example, simply in certain countries the taxman might harass taxpayers for no good reason. A classic example was, of that was Vodafone uh, in India where the government just, blind, just went for it, just attacked Vodafone for no reason and then the Supreme Court had to throw the case out. Um, depending on which country you're in, it can be used politically, the information to hurt opposition leaders. There could be blackmail of uh, political and rich individuals. Journalists may leak it in the public interest, as we've seen with the Panama Papers. Okay, um, once the information is leaked, you can have kidnapping, as people know where the assets are. And once, of course, you know where assets are, what is to stop the seizing or freezing of bank accounts in a foreign country by your own government? I mean, you only have to look at Julian Assange. If, if the government actually knew where his bank accounts were, they could freeze them with a click of a finger. So a lot of risks, I believe. Indeed, and I think Stuart, I mean, from a, from a US Congress perspective, uh, I think there's some concerns there too as well. Uh, that's, that's correct, Samantha. Uh, as Paul pointed out, in order for the 
any country to participate in the CRS, they first have to have domestic legislation in place. And for that to happen, the U.S. Congress might have to pass some legislation. And in congressional hearings over the last six months, members of both parties have expressed concerns not only about data security, about, but also about misuse of data along the lines uh, that Isha has just talked about. Uh, I'm not going to indict journalists, being a journalist, but uh, especially given uh, the uh, current status of the LuxLeaks defendants uh, who actually brought many abuses in, in Luxembourg to the public, into the public uh, uh, daylight. But mm -hmm. there are concerns, uh, and, and uh, the, Secretary, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Bob Stack, has talked about the fact that if the U.S. were to exchange information with another tax administration, and that other country were to misuse or leak the data, then they would, the U.S. would shut off the pipeline. But we have an expression that's called uh, closing the barn door after the horse has left. And so uh, the U.S. is very concerned about data security. Uh, I know that uh, uh, one of the things that the Secretary uh, has talked about, uh, the Assistant Secretary, is the notion that we have in place an exchange of information mechanism through our bilateral tax treaties in the U.S. And until some of these data security and uh, privacy issues are resolved, I think the U.S. is going to want to rely on that. Uh, I, I do want to add one other thing, which is that this notion of, uh, of misuse of information, it's one thing for a country to have laws in place that secure tax information and secure financial information. But those laws are administered by people. And there are governments around the world who use this kind of information to attack their political opponents. And uh, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, we've heard stories about uh, countries where the leaders of the country have done that. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that the US uh, wants to uh, buy into a system where that is a possibility. Indeed. I mean, it's either going to be a big question mark that a lot of people are going to be worrying about, um, you know, for some time to come. Um, so moving forward, um, Paul, can you tell us a bit about what uh, some of the other challenges for the OECD uh, may have when it comes to actually implementing CRS? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I think uh, also referring to the uh, comments just made by Ish and Stewart um, and, 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 and uh, then going further uh, on, on precisely that topic, I think it's indeed important to, 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 to be aware that, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, there, there, there may be uh, cases where um, the results of an exchange of information relationship may be undesirable. Um, and I think all those cases that were just mentioned, um, so the, the leak cases, also the, the, the cases in the political sphere, um, the legal instruments on which the exchange is based actually quite clearly uh, already provide for exceptions to the exchange of information relationship. And uh, uh, of course, while we are working under a multilateral instrument, a multilateral convention, um, the exchange relationships are bilateral. Um, and, and there will be, of course, um, uh, that's, I think, also part, logically, of the global forum review process. There will, of course, be a certain consideration that will need to be given to certain instances where, uh, for uh, political reasons, uh, certain countries may not be able to exchange with each other. I think that is, that is something which is already the case in the current international framework. And, and, and that has already been accommodated in the multilateral convention. Um, so I think that's part of the implementation issues. And in terms of the implementation challenges that we're, that we're seeing, well, I think there, um, um, uh, the, the, the common reporting standard, in, in particular, if you take it with the commentary, is, uh, of course, a document of 200 plus pages. Um, but uh, bearing in mind that we're dealing with a very complex uh, matter, uh, I mean, the global financial system is not an easy system to um, to grasp or, or, or indeed to, to, to qualify uh, by a set of definitions. Uh, of course, uh, a key part of our work, therefore, is uh, bringing f uh, further clarity in, in, in cases where the financial sector has told us that they find certain definitions ambiguous or unclear, um, where, where certain qualifications uh, need, 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 need to be uh, better separated. So there's a lot of implementation work going on, on, that, uh, on uh, in that regard. And then, of course, we're also uh, trying to do uh, our, our very best in, in, for and 
ensuring that the quality of the data that is going to be exchanged um, is, is as good as possible and, and uh, of course besides the procedures that are already in the common reporting standard what we're very much focused on is also uh, providing the necessary IT tools to make sure that additional validations of the data can be carried out and also that uh, both financial institutions and governments are in a position to provide feedback in terms of the quality of the data that they have exchanged and also uh, of course notify each other of common errors so that's um, a, a space that we're very active in um, and, 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 and of course uh, there, there is uh, uh, always a lot of follow-up work uh, going on in this area. Um, there, there is not a common reporting standard but uh, you will not have missed uh, a lot of uh, the uh, discussions recently about uh, beneficial ownership and of course while that's not a directly common reporting standard related there is uh, for those of you that uh, are very familiar with the, with the area, there is of course a certain link between what uh, the Financial Action Task Force says about controlling persons and beneficial owners. Um, so, so there is also of course uh, uh, work for us to do and see how these interactions play out and, and, and what is to be done in the future. Super, that's great. Um, so um, Ish, going forward, um, what sort of the challenges do you think that's going to be faced with implementing this CRS? Um, I, I think Paul has mentioned uh, quite a few. I, I agree with him that the um, definitions are somewhat vague and the OECD will need to develop these. Um, that may not be easy, as you said, because the, obviously the, the system is varied around the world. Um, but really the, the protection is not there for uh, citizens um, if governments misuse data. And so in the worst case they say, okay, we'll shut the pipeline and we won't um, exchange, but that's about it. There are no there are no safeguards for individuals. Um, there is a loophole in the uh, CRS legislation in the in the sense that two countries, having shared the data for tax purposes, can agree to use it for other purposes, and that could be anything. It could be used for any purpose whatsoever, which is a bit a bit scary. Um, the I I don't really I I think um, there's an issue with the benefits with the benefits accruing. Uh, with the exchange of information and the cost of doing so. I believe the beneficiaries will principally be the EU and the losers will be offshore centers. Um, and so that's something which will have to be looked at uh, later on. And I don't see the benefits uh, which will accrue to the CRS, uh, uh, to the Western countries, um, in the sense that even if you look at FATCA, uh, the IRS spends 10 times as much in uh, collection costs as it does in actually raising additional revenue. And I've not seen any um, um, any estimates from uh, from the OECD as to the efficiency of collection. What is the OECD expecting financial institutions to spend to do this work? What are they expecting governments to spend? And what revenue are they expecting to raise? Paul, could you maybe uh, reply to that comment? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Samantha. I think the first part of the, I'm, I'm not sure that we, I'm, I think we're speaking maybe a little bit on another page um, about the other use. I think the protections of the uh, of the multilateral convention um, uh, are, are very clear that um, without the prior consent of the other party, um, there is no other legitimate use of the information but administrative use for tax purposes in, in, in articles uh, uh, just out of my mind, I think it's Article 22, uh, Paragraph 4. I might might have the number uh, one or two wrong, but it's in, in that part of the convention in the low 20s. Uh, I think it's 22. Um, so, so it's very clear, and I think it's also the international agreement that, of course, this information can only be used for uh, administrative tax purposes, and 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 of course. Uh, you cannot uh, engage in international uh, relations if you do not uh, uh, start from the principle that uh, treaties will be followed um, and, and, and uh, that uh, those uh, requirements are met. And I think if, from the on-request space, we are quite comfortable um, that uh, that, that uh, uh, procedure is in fact uh, well respected. Um, I would say even some of our delegates around the OECD table um, uh, make an argument frequently that uh, for instance the use for criminal tax purposes should be more readily uh, agreed to because they feel that that's a barrier and of course if you see that that's a barrier that sort of indicates that you that you are fully aware that you cannot not use that information for purposes that go beyond administrative tax procedures. Um, so, so I think that's very clear that that is a legal obligation that all countries are 
are, are, are bound by that uh, the information is limited in terms of use. Um, I think of the benefits of uh, the benefits of the common reporting standard. I think you, they are of course extremely difficult to quantify. I mean, anybody who would say that they are easy to quantify would probably not be telling the truth. Um, and I think the common reporting standard has two, uh, uh, or, or maybe even three, different uh, uh, effects. I think the first effect, and that is what you have seen very clearly already since 2014, and maybe even slightly before that, when it became apparent that the world was changing towards more transparency, is an enormous uptake in uh, voluntary disclosures uh, uh, around uh, the uh, uh, Western world. I mean, the latest numbers we have over the last five years that we collect from our membership is that in our membership over the last five years alone, um, and, and of course there is a peak in the, in the last year and, 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 and a significant increase, uh, really a, a, a multiplication since 2014, um, the latest number uh, in our membership in terms of what, of, uh, what additional tax revenue was obtained uh, stands just above 50 billion uh, euros. So that is, a, a, as you can, as you can see already, a, a very significant uh, change in terms of tax revenues. Uh, I think then there is a second effect, and that's, that's uh, difficult to quantify, of course, at this stage, and that is uh, uh, what, what will actually be disclosed as a consequence of the common reporting standards. So what uh, sources of uh, revenue, uh, what kind of financial income will become apparent um, due to the reporting. Um, that's something I think all countries are very, very interested in, and we're, of course, going to try to keep track of that at an OECD level um, starting in 2017. And then I think there was a third effect, and that's even more difficult to quantify, but I think nonetheless very significant also going forward, and that's a deterrent effect. Um, uh, the effect of let's not engage in this kind of behavior anymore because it becomes too unpredictable, too risky, I might get caught and uh, voluntary disclosure programs in many jurisdictions are coming to an end so I will face the full force of the law including criminal sanctions and uh, there are of course many taxpayers that, that, that want to uh, avoid going down that route and therefore are already uh, coming clean. So I think there's these three effects. Um, one is clearly clear is, is quantifiable, it's the voluntary disclosure, the regulation of the past aspect and going forward of course we'll try to keep track of it as good as we can uh, because I think that's a very legitimate question that will, that will uh, come up at uh, the level of many parliaments and governments. It's the question, well uh, now we have this piece of legislation in place, um, uh, what about the value for money? So I think that's of course something that we are going to monitor closely going forward. Indeed. I mean, Stuart, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on the matter in terms of whether the information should be used by other agencies and, and whether the cost of collection outweighs revenue. Well, I will say I want to piggyback on something Paul just said, which is that when the federal government, the U.S. government, passed the FATCA law back in 2010, it followed on the heels of a series of voluntary disclosure programs. And I just checked, and as of this, as of this month, uh, the U.S. has seen 45,000 voluntary disclosures alone and has collected six and a half billion U.S. dollars in additional taxes, penalties, and interest. So in terms of the deterrent effect, it clearly has a deterrent effect. Uh, as for the uh, issue of whether other agents should be, agencies should be able to use the information uh, if the signatories to the agreement agree that it can be used that way, Certainly one reason for the FATCA law, and I believe one reason for the common reporting standards, is to attack uh, international money laundering and organized crime that crosses international borders. And I think if countries want to agree that they'll exchange information to attack money laundering and organized crime, illegal arms dealing, illegal drug dealing, that is something that uh, the OECD countries have agreed on and that bilaterally countries ought to be able to use financial information to do that. And piggybacking on one other thing that Paul said, uh, this notion of the uh, uh, beneficial ownership issues, which has just recently come to light. I mean, people who practice in this in this space know that beneficial ownership is an issue, but it really came to the public light with the release of the uh, Panama Papers, because countries around the world, uh, not only in what are traditionally thought of as tax haven jurisdictions, but here in the United States as well, you can set up entities in many, many different places and the government entities have no idea, the tax administrators have no idea who's behind it. And I think what we're going to see as CRS moves forward with implementation and as the rest of the world moves toward having law enforcement at least have access to beneficial ownership information, you're going to see 
uh, a more and more effort to try to identify beneficial owners as well, and that being uh, um, added on to the CRS mandate. I mean, each that's probably going to going to be a, a conversation that you have with a number of clients, I'm sure, um, going forward. I mean, is there uh, have you have you had approaches or any thoughts about how this could be dealt with? We don't we don't actually have an issue with uh, beneficial ownership because the reality is you have to dis you have to disclose that to banks in any case. Uh, it's a it's another issue about whether it's automatically available. That's another argument. Uh, but certainly, there's no there's no um, there is no way you can open a bank account. Uh, or have a financial relationship without disclosing the UDO in my opinion. So certainly the, certainly the, uh, the days of nominees, etc. are finished in the sense of, you know, you can't hide behind them. Um, so I, I suspect if people aren't taking advice and getting proper structures, those structures will fail. But certainly with proper structures, some people are using nominees purely to, to um, to hide for non non tax reasons. An example was Emma Watson, uh, who who was you know in the, named in the family case, and she literally had the BVI company um, to be used to be hidden from a commercial angle as opposed to any nefarious tax reasons. So there are there are different there are different reasons why people use nominees. But certainly, I believe uh, the disclosure is there when it comes to tax. Indeed. I mean, Paul, from, a, from an OECD perspective, obviously financial services institutions are, you know, highly concerned about this um, difference in the in the compliance costs that they're going. They believe it would be significantly increased. Um, I mean, is there? I mean, do you have statistics that are, you know, to look at the the costs that are going to be incurred? You know. No, I think there are. I mean, there are. Of course, some uh, quite quite a number of, of, of individual. I mean, I don't have those numbers uh, numbers. Uh, I don't know them out, know them out, out of top of my out of the top of my head. But I know that there are um, uh, quite a number of of financial institutions who have tried to estimate the, the additional compliance costs as a consequence of uh, the implementation of both FATCA and the Common Reporting Standard and, 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 and what, what that has uh, uh, meant for them in terms of, of uh, hiring additional uh, staff, changing their client onboarding systems, um, of course the whole uh, compliance activities as a whole and, and, and I think um, when, when drafting the common reporting standard, we have tried to, as much as we could, of course, uh, to, to, to uh, both be inspired by FATCA um, and, and, and the way uh, FATCA works and, 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 and the principles uh, and the reporting obligations contained therein, and on the other hand, also trying to uh, uh, be close to what uh, the, um, and, and Isha has just referred to it, what the financial act task force requires in terms of anti-money laundering and, and know your customer uh, obligations. Um, so, so I think there, there has been a, there has really been an effort made to, to try to as closely as we could align to uh, uh, both these uh, pieces of regulation that already exist. Um, now it's, on, uh, it's, 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 it's of course very clear that uh, there is an additional compliance cost uh, that financial institutions uh, uh, need to uh, need to take on. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm afraid to say that, that to a certain extent, uh, I, I think that's um, uh, part of being in the global financial system in the 21st century, um, that there is an expectation that when the global uh, financial uh, system uh, moves to 21st century technology and a level of sophistication, that really means that uh, it is extremely easy um, to uh, engage in financial uh, transactions agro across the world and to and to move your financial assets. That also, of course, the tax authorities um, need access uh, to that information in a global manner. Um, and I think uh, I, I, it is a part of the effort, this, these transparency initiatives, to bring uh, our, our tax administrations and our governments uh, to the 21st century as well in terms of their compliance tools. Um, and I think that's a reflection um, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, why the common reporting standard uh, is, is far-reaching in terms of compliance activities precisely because it, needs to, it, it is necessary to have accurate reporting um, uh, to countries uh, across the globe in terms of what has uh, been going on uh, f by their residents uh, in terms of how they structured their financial uh, uh, transactions and their financial assets around the world. Mm. 
I mean, CRS has been developed and it's influenced by the creation and, and implementation of FATCA reporting. Stuart, um, what sort of differences do you see between CRS and FATCA? Do you think one of them will end up being more efficient um, in collecting the information than the other? Well, I, it's interesting that you ask. Uh, we've had some experience, but not a lot with FATCA in terms of uh, working with other governments to bring uh, to have their financial institutions reporting to those governments to exchange the information with the uh, U.S. Treasury. And that has, I think, served as a good model for the way the, uh, the uh, multilateral agreement is going to work under CRS. One of the things that I think is very helpful that the, that the OECD has done is in the handbook that Paul talked about, they have published kind of a side-by-side, -side, a comparison of the different terms uh, and how they how they uh, align and how they're a bit out of alignment between FATCA and CRS. Uh, I think <laughs> the biggest issue in terms of comparing their effectiveness is that the United States hasn't signed on to CRS. And, and ever since I, I have been uh, working as editor of Tax Notes International, the biggest concern I get when I travel and I talk to people in different parts of the world is, why can the U.S. demand all of this information, make all the banks and all the other countries in the world jump, but when it comes to exchanging information in the other direction, the U.S. Uh, is not so quick to act. And I think that's a legitimate, uh, I think that's a legitimate concern. And, and it remains to be seen how this will play out as the countries begin to report under the CRS uh, starting next year. Yeah, I mean, indeed. I mean, when it comes to the U.S., reciprocity is, is a big issue. Um, well, you know, so. <laughs> I, I agree. And, and having uh, uh, worked as a trial lawyer in the uh, on issues about uh, appropriate access to information and whether people are using the information uh, for the purposes for which it's gathered, those are legitimate concerns that the U.S. government has. But I really think that the uh, the way to work through them is or the uh, uh, appropriate officials at Treasury and at the IRS to work with their counterparts, not only uh, at OECD, but at the Forum on Tax Administration and at the FDA, to, uh, to uh, see if there's some common ground so that the U.S. can be part of this reciprocal information exchange apart from its bilateral tax treaties. Ace, have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I quite agree. I mean, America's in a position to say no because it can. I mean, it really is that, that straightforward. And if you can, my view is why not? I mean, that's, uh, that's part of life. Indeed. Uh, Paul, um, out of interest, so how has the developing world reacted to CRS? I mean, are there any particular problems that they, they'll be facing um, in the developing world that are necessarily being faced by the, you know, the already developed jurisdictions? Uh, yeah. Yes, I think it's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question and of course it's a concern to us because um, uh, I, I think if you uh, look at the broader picture of the committed jurisdictions, um, you will see that, that there are in fact very few uh, developing countries in the classical sense of the world. So, uh, so you will find of course emerging markets uh, such as the BRICS countries and uh, you might also find a number of other uh, countries that are somewhere in sort of in the, in the, in the emerging uh, phase of, 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 of economic development. Um, and I think that a part of that is due uh, to, uh, to the fact that uh, the uh, commitment process, of course, only asked developed countries and, and financial centers to commit to the standard. So um, I think that that is part of, of the acknowledgement uh, that, that the common reporting standard and the implementation requires quite a bit of legal and operational uh, work for both governments and of course also for financial institutions in to, in to implement and that in, 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 in quite some instances it would not be um, adequate for uh, developing countries that might have very few offshore accounts uh, to in fact implement uh, the legislation and, 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 and the operational structure. That, that, that uh, having said, there are um, uh, quite a number of, of, of jurisdictions um, uh, that are not in the classical scope, I would say, of uh, uh, of uh, what you would uh, see a, as a highly developed country or indeed a, a, a financial center that have nonetheless uh, uh, committed and are and in our very 
interested in starting exchange and, and, and the OECD together with the Global Forum um, has put in place a, a whole set of uh, pilot projects where basically a developed country um, uh, provides assistance to a committed jurisdiction um, to uh, put in place the common reporting standard uh, and examples of that include uh, uh, Colombia, uh, the Philippines uh, and indeed Ghana um, who have all committed to the standard and I think going forward of course um, there, there will also be a focus to continue to help developing countries uh, uh, to also benefit from the uh, information that is already being uh, collected in many cases by financial institutions on non-resident account holders that they may they might be interested in, um, and I think as, as part of that, um, I, I, I was at a, a conference in Switzerland some uh, months ago, and there, of course, also uh, a question in the uh, in the audience to which one of the uh, other participants spoke quite in a quite lengthy manner. Uh, was what do we do as financial institutions with those clients that are uh, resident in jurisdictions that are not committed jurisdictions uh, and, and I think that of course is, is then mainly related to developing countries. Um, what is our approach to these clients? I mean if you would see it in a strict sense of the word of course there is not going to be an automatic exchange of information under the common reporting standard to those countries in, in 2017 or 2018, um, but um, there is of course also a question to be asked, well, um, what is our position, what is the position we should take, um, bearing in mind that it is not uh, entirely unlikely that these countries will join in the five or ten years to come. Um, so I, I think that debate is going on at many levels, so definitely we try to, 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 to assist those countries that are interested in joining. Um, with, with, with implementation if they want and, 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 and I'm quite sure that the uh, uh, scope of developing countries joining the common reporting standard will, will increase as time goes by um, and I think it makes sense to first let the financial centers and developed countries gain experience uh, so that then uh, you can also su successfully implement such a complex project in, in the developing world. Yeah, Stuart, um, any thoughts about, the, about these issues? Uh, yes, thank you, Sam. Uh, the, this mirrors discussions that the OECD and the UN are having with countries in the developing world about building capacity for their tax administration systems. We are seeing this with the BEPS project. We are seeing a concerted effort by the countries in OECD and in the developed world to help countries in the developing world <coughs> uh, develop the capacity to be able to do complex audits, to handle this kind of financial information, and to use it in a way that supports uh, the needs of their people in terms of infrastructure, in terms of investment in public health, public safety, education. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think will be, uh, this will be part of is not only with BAPS, not only with OECD, but the Otis Forum that happened last year in terms of uh, uh, of enabling tax administrations in the developing world to build, to uh, 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 not only implement these laws, but to do it in a way that benefits their citizens. And uh, somebody was telling me, I was uh, at a conference a couple months ago, and I understand, for example, that Kenya just completed their first advanced pricing agreement. So now we're bringing transfer pricing issues into the forefront as well in the developing world. Asia, any comments? Yeah, I think the um, I think the BRICS are very interested in uh, joining because obviously places like uh, Russia, and India, they have a lot of money uh, parked outside by their nationals, and they're very keen on finding that and obviously taxing it. Um, on the other hand, the lesser developed countries, you know, which are tiny offshore centres, etc., they actually have no incentive to join. So I don't know how they're joining. I personally believe they're fearful of being uh, blacklisted, etc. Uh, some other fears, losing foreign grants, etc. Um, but the the sad thing is that they're the ones who can't actually afford to uh, implement these things. And there seems to be no there seems to be no uh, help offered uh, by the richer countries to help these countries to do so. I mean, f certain grants, etc., would be welcome. I would have thought. Paul, have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I think that's not quite right. I mean, if 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 um, um, uh, there is actually a lot of uh, technical assistance from the uh, Global Forum and not only from the Global Forum, also from other, uh, say, traditional large uh, developed economies 
uh, going on to help the smaller offshore centers, uh, and I'm also, of course, I'm particularly thinking about the Caribbean uh, space, but, 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 but not only, um, uh, in terms of uh, helping them uh, to draft their legislation, uh, making sure that they can uh, rely on uh, reliable uh, IT infrastructure. Um, I, for instance, know that the Netherlands is conducting uh, that project in relation to 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 its uh, uh, overseas territories. So the, the Dutch, the former Dutch Antilles, um, the, there there is uh, a, a lot of capacity building going on. I mean, we had we had uh, uh, already two workshops. Uh, uh, specifically for the Pacific okay. Islands and the Caribbean this year to, to help countries uh, uh, to, uh, to implement the common reporting standards. So there's a whole host of things going on. And most importantly, I mean, I've referred to it already before, I think there are also the common transmission system. So if you want uh, the pipeline for transmitting the information uh, that we are developing with, with, with a large group of countries, um, that of course will also uh, be to the benefit of uh, of, of the uh, smaller uh, financial centers in the Caribbean and in, 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 in the Pacific, um, uh, because uh, of course, as in line with with, with how the global forum in, uh, would work in general, uh, there is always a certain consideration given uh, when you look at the uh, fees per country. Um, to the fact that the country is uh, a small country and, 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 and financial resources, um, so um, so uh, I think that will be uh, reflected uh, at the level of, of, of the cost sharing of the common transmission system as well. Um, so I think there is actually a whole a whole battery of, of, of different uh, things going on. Help with legislation, help with IT tools to make. Uh, uh, the reporting happen uh, so to, to be able to take in the information from your financial institutions and to then send it out to the uh, partner jurisdictions and indeed also uh, through the common transmission system uh, by providing an, uh, an up-to-speed IT tool to actually uh, send that information across. Okay. No, not really. I, I believe the OECD has um, lovely utopian uh, views and uh, I don't really think they're that, that, that they're concerned about the costs to, it's not just countries, it's to small economies and also the actual financial institutions in those. I mean, financial institutions, a lot of them will be wiped out simply with the costs of compliance. I mean, if, if you want a job now, I believe yeah. compliance is the, is the growth industry, I believe. Yeah. Stuart, final comments? No, I think, uh, I think we said it all. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, so we've had a question from uh, our listeners. Um, and they are interested in learning whether or not there's going to be a supranational organisation to control money laundering and tax evasion. Um, what do you think uh, of proposals by sort of many of the tax justice activists on, on arranging this type of thing? Um, sure. Uh, I was at a conference last week at the World Bank, uh, organised by uh, uh, I will refer to as the reform wing of international taxation. Uh, and uh, I think that there are people in the international tax community who would like to see something like that happen. I also think, and I wrote about this in my uh, editor's book this week, uh, about the fact that many people in the business community are extremely distrustful of government. They're, ex they're even more distrustful of governments that represent people that they do, in countries where they don't live or operate. And so uh, following on my dad's admonition about the golden rule, which is that he who has the gold makes the rules, uh, I think that the odds on something like that happening are fairly, are fairly small. I think that uh, there are avenues where uh, countries uh, in, and especially law enforcement arms in those countries are working together to combat tax evasion and money laundering. And I think of something that's uh, the acronym is JITSIC, where uh, tax administrators are working together to identify soft spots in the system and, and opportunities for uh, evildoers, to use a phrase uh, popularized by a former president. To, uh, to game the system uh, to the detriment of the general public. And I think that uh, that is a system that uh, is what we have now. And I, I really don't see uh, there being enough popular will to move beyond just voluntary cooperation and cooperation through bilateral and multilateral treaties. Paul, have you got any thoughts about a type of organization like this? 
Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I can see, um, uh, of course, uh, that there has, has been a lot of attention given to this particular area of policy in the wake of the Panama Papers, and then, of course, there's this, I think, very human and natural reaction, uh, we now have to do something about it, this was clearly not effective uh, so far, so we need to change our game, and I think that was echoed by many uh, uh, people in the, in the media, by politicians, uh, by, by by a whole set of stakeholders um, uh, in, in the debate. Um, I, I think from, 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 the OE, uh, from the OECD perspective, um, it, it is quite clear that we have received a number of mandates, both from the G20 at their meeting um, uh, last, uh, last April, as well as from uh, the anti-corruption summit that took place in, in London last, uh, this month, in fact. Um, and and, and I, I think uh, the focus there is very clear. I think we have we have uh, different sets of of, of uh, uh, work that are already being done. Um, I mean, I already referred to the uh, Financial Action Task Force and the work that they are doing in terms of making sure that anti-money laundering and, and know your customer rules are implemented um, uh, uh, across the world. Uh, then there is, of course, our, our tax piece, tax piece, if you want, with the Common Reporting Standard. Um, and, and, and other uh, related uh, transparency initiatives. Um, and, and, and then there is, I guess, uh, work also done by financial intelligence units and, 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 and both, both in terms of, uh, of, of uh, financial crime more broadly and tax crime specifically. Um, and I think before thinking about uh, any institutional frameworks, uh, how that might look, and I, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of any plans to, to think that we need an additional international organization to deal with this. I think what is, what is key in this is better, are two things. One is better sharing and better, uh, and better cooperation, both between uh, the different international organizations that play a role in this, um, uh, and also, more importantly, I should say, uh, between governments. Of course, it's, it's key that this information is available to the governments that actually need this information because it is relevant to their uh, uh, country, because it concerns their citizens or their, indeed their residents. Um, and, and, I, and I think there is, a, is, an, is an equally important part, and hopefully the CRS can play an, an important role in that going forward, and that is to make sure that the FAT of standards are effectively implemented and also also, uh, very importantly, that the quality of the beneficial ownership information um, gets better. I think that the, the, the number one echo that we hear, uh, both from the financial sector and from governments, is, well, we have already quite a lot of uh, uh, standards in the area. Uh, what we really need is to improve quality, to improve implementation, um, and to improve information sharing. So I think that's really the prime focus, um, as far as I would see it at the moment. Thank you very much, Paul. Ish, we have a, a particular question uh, for you. Um, as the author of the Common Reporting Standards Survivors Guide to OECD Automatic Exchange of Information of Offshore Financial Accounts, um, what influenced you to use the word Survivors Guide in the book title? Uh, actually, when I, when I was approached by this <laughs> about a year ago, um, it was actually by a, um, uh, a university professor of law for tax and from Europe, and who, who requested me to explain to him what, this, what is the CRS. And I actually didn't know what it was. And then I looked into it, and I said, oh, well, I'll write you an eight-page summary on it, and uh, that'll help you. Then I began to delve into it, and then I realized what a beast it is. And my, my eight-page booklet became a 700-page book. That's actually what happened. And then I realized all the other issues behind it. It wasn't simply a matter of, oh, let's just share information. It was a, many issues, issues of sovereignty, uh, uh, privacy, uh, all sorts of issues are being, um, uh, all sorts of issues are involved here. If you like the rich world fighting the poor world, uh, so it depends you know, if you support the underdog, and being from England, we do. Uh, so it's all, all sorts of things. And so I tried to then, uh, explain this in a very simple, in very simple terms, uh, so that people would actually understand the the rationale behind it, what's really going on, the the dirty politics involved of all this, and how it's basically a few rich um, EU countries pushing the whole whole deal, and of course the biggest biggest exception being the USA, which I believe will be one of the biggest winners uh, out of the CRS. You know, my view is, you know, the client comes to me, or you know, one of my clients has already flown to. The states and is happily opening bank accounts there. Doesn't seem to be any problem. The OECD, 
the OECDC doesn't seem to have any issues with the US not being party to it. Uh, in fact, the OECD doesn't comment. I mean, they don't seem to have a view at all. So um, it's really to, to des you know, it was designed to get the message out to the public. And then, of course, uh, explaining what actions people can take uh, to protect their privacy and so on. That's great, Ish. And also for our listeners, uh, you'll find that there's a handout attached to the, the webinar, uh, which also gives you a link to Ish's CRS book um, and offers a discount uh, for anyone who's attended this webinar today. So um, click through and read more of his 700 pages. Um, so just we're at our hour. Our hour is nearly up now. So um, just closing comments, really. And I think this has been a really great um, hour of conversation regarding CRS and and so we've touched on quite a number of different subjects and sort of bounced around a bit. So, um, Stuart, closing thoughts? I just uh, I thank you for uh, for the webinar, for uh, taxlink.net for putting on the uh, webinar and for inviting me. I will say that uh, what seems to have started is a unilateral effort in 2009 and 2010 has now become global. And uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to a system where there was one, there were one or two places in the world where you could hide your money. There will always be people who will hide their money, but it's going to be harder and harder as these standards uh, uh, become ubiquitous. Yeah, I quite agree with you. I think the times are changing now for the better in terms of tax evasion. Paul, closing thoughts? Yes, thank you, Samantha, for this very interesting seminar, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with what Stuart has just said. I think um, this is really a, uh, a process that has started, and of course, it's always the interesting thing with these uh, uh, political momentums that all of a sudden arise, and then, and then things become possible that, that in 2008, uh, I think very few people in the tax field, including myself, would have thought uh, were possible. Um, uh, and I think that's exactly the benefit of the CRS. Of course, there is a... Uh, uh, there, there is a lot of work that still remains to be done, but I think the major achievement is that there is a really global initiative now being uh, unfolded and that there is, of course, a learning curve for everybody, um, for financial institutions, for governments, and not in the, in the last place for us as the OECD, uh, as the custodians, uh, to see uh, where, the, where the strong points, where the weak points are going forward. But I think one thing the CRS will definitely do um, it is. It will make uh, offshore tax evasion a whole lot more difficult, and uh, I think very importantly is it takes away uh, a part of the of of the offshore tax evasion space um, that was. Uh, um, uh, oh, I'll just uh, move my money uh, offshore, put it in a bank account, and nobody will ever know because there is no communication. Um, I, I think the CRS has not pretended it is the end of all forms of tax crime, including uh, offshore tax evasion. But I think you will need to get a lot more sophisticated, and it will be a lot more difficult to argue that you didn't know what you were doing uh, going forward when you did something that was not proper. And I think that's already a major achievement in itself. Super. And Ish, your final comments for today? Yeah, well, thank you for uh, publicizing the CRS. Um, one of the difficulties I have when I talk to people is uh, no one is actually, no one seems to be really aware of it. I talk to clients, they say we've heard rumors, we then approach their banks, the banks turn around and say, we don't know, we're too scared to comment because our regulator is not commenting. Then we approach the regulator and the regulator says, you know, we're too scared to comment because the OECD is not commenting. And so, effectively, everyone's in the dark. Uh, this thing is being railroaded through, and uh, it remains to be seen how, how it will work. And again, I come back to, it's a wonderful utopian uh, ideal. But the question is, will it, be, uh, will it actually collect enough taxes to justify the sheer cost of this great uh, white elephant? Smashing. Thanks ever so much to all our three panelists today. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on, on behalf of TaxLink, I want to thank all of you for uh, participating in this wonderful event. Uh, thank you, Paul, from OECD. Thanks, Ish, uh, Samantha, Stuart. I think uh, it was very useful for our members and for everyone who attended. Uh, some admin issues just to wrap things up. Uh, we will have the audio recording ready uh, within a few days, uh, so look out for that. And the transcript should be available to all of you within a couple weeks or so. I'm going to blog about it, and I will uh, post it online. Uh, I will share with all of you for you to share with uh, your network, etc. cetera. Uh, so with that said, uh, thank you so much for uh, participating, and I look forward to continuing the discussion in some other setting sometime soon. Uh, so thank you very much, and thanks for Masha, who's right here next to me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.